with your young friends in college or in, in the corporate world, in the call center. You know, the, the, the biggest challenge today is this. And in walks in the middle, I mean, it's a lot of tension after a fall of the Indian wicket is Yuvraj Singh. I remember that moment very, very clearly. It's there, green in my mind. And Yuvraj Singh comes in and uh, he hits the first ball he faces. The very first ball he faces, you know, he just stands here, left hand batsman. He just, he almost caressed the ball and the ball went for a six. And I thought, wow, I didn't know hitting a six was so easy. Wow, I didn't know hitting a six was so easy. There are some batsmen who are so skillful that they will make uh, hitting a six so simple like Ivrat Singh. And when you listen to some speakers, you know, thank God for a, a precious few speakers all across the world and from our nation who are very skillful when it, coming, when it comes to communicating God's word or the gospel with young people. They make it look so easy. But the fact of the matter is, it is not so easy communicating the gospel to young people. And that is the biggest challenge. Even a man like Apostle Paul, if you look at Acts chapter 20 in your Bible, Acts chapter 20 and verse 9, what happens is Paul is talking on and on in a meeting. And there are people listening to him all over the place. Some are sitting on the balcony. There is a young man who listens to Paul. And when Paul goes on and on and the meeting goes past 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock and it goes past, is going towards midnight, that man, young man sleeps and falls to the, falls to the ground dead. Thank God, you know, God raised that young man alive when Paul prayed for him. But the fact remains the same, that young man was sleeping when Paul was preaching. Now, how do you speak to young people so that they are not yawning, but earning? You see the spelling difference? Earning. Y-E-A-R-N. Earning, not yawning. There's one person in the Bible, one character in the Bible who talked about that. His name is Prophet Amos. Now, if you read Amos chapter 8 verse 13, he talks about how young people are earning for God's word, longing for God's word. The longing is like, you know, a girl is waiting in, in the hostel. The, her boyfriend said he will come at 4 o'clock. And it's 4.15. There's no sound of a, her boyfriend's bike. So every bike sound that she hears, she's thinking it's her boyfriend at the hostel gate. And she's longing. She's earning. That kind of earning for, not for the boyfriend, but for God's word, the Bible. How do you communicate God's word so that young people are not yawning but earning? That's what Prophet Amos talks about in Amos chapter 8 verse 13. He says, lovely young girls will faint of word thirst. Robust young men will faint of God thirst. This is the contemporary English version by Eugene Peterson. Lovely young girls, young girls longing for God's word. Robust young men, handsome young men, fainting to hear God's word or fainting for the word of God come, to come to them. Who talks about it? Amos. Now if he talks about it, he, I believe he knows how we can actually bring about that. If he talks about young people learning for God's word, longing for God's word, I am sure Amos knows what it takes to bring about that effect. So what I've learned from Amos, I'm going to share with you. Now, in many ways, Amos is the Bible's Lalu Prasad Yadav. You know Lalu Prasad Yadav? A shepherd who went on to become a politician. Yadav from the Yadav community, the shepherd community. You know, he, he, he's known for his one-liners like this. Jab tak alu samosa mein rehega, tab tak lalu bihar mein raksh karega. When other parliamentarians are speaking, the parliament is going, sort of dozing. Some of them are checking their emails through the Blackberry, some of them are sending SMSs, some of them are sending, you know, some of them are yawning, dozing, but not when Lalu Prasad Yadav is speaking. An interesting speaker, a shepherd who became a orator. That's the story of Amos. If you read Amos chapter 7 verse 14, he gives us testimony, one verse testimony. He said, I was a shepherd. I was a sycamore fig picker. Now he was a picker of sycamore fig trees. Fig, he was a picker of fig fruit. 
And you know, if you talk to Bible scholars, they'll tell you the food of the poor people of those times was the fig fruit. Fig fruit. And he was a man who picked up figs one time. He was a shepherd. And then one day, God called him to be his spokesman for his generation. And how did he do it? He was not sophisticated. He was not learned. He didn't go to a top college and get a top degree. He was an ordinary shepherd boy. How many of you have felt that you, you, know, you are so weak and so simple and you sometimes think, can God use me? I've thought about that. Because, you know, I come, you know, uh, I come from a family. My father you, well, lived in a, uh, you know how he studied? He studied under the under the tube light because they didn't have electricity in his house. That, that's how, that's the kind of family I come from. My wife comes from an interior village in the northern part of Tamil Nadu. Interior village. That village is still backward even till today. Some of us think, I'm from a, such a poor background. I cannot speak. I, I maybe I, my English isn't that good. Can God use me to reach the modern generation? Yes, he can. If he can use Amos, he can use you and me. If he can use the ordinary picker of fruits to pick souls, young souls for his kingdom, he can use you. He can use you. And with that encouragement, I want to begin. I want to give you 10 words and it will be there on your notes. So uh, follow along. But I would like to encourage you to write because I will say something which the Holy Spirit will Tell me to tell you, but it may not be there in the notes. So I encourage you to write. How do we communicate God's word to today's young people? How do we overcome the very basic challenge of communication? How do we do that? First, supplicate. Supplicate, pray. First, kneel down. And sometimes when you talk about young people, modern young people, young people are always with a gadget. I understand from Amos' life, we must get down on our knees. Get down on our knees and pray. That's the first step in effectively communicating the gospel with young people. Amos had a burden for souls. That's why he got down on his knees. If you read chapter 7 of Amos, we walk into his prayer room. God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon Israel. And Amos walks into his prayer room and says, Please, Lord, Israel is a small nation. Please don't do it. He does it two times. He is consistent in his prayer life. Maybe after a meeting like this, you will go home and you will decide, I'm going to pray for one hour every day. And we get a prayer attack and then it goes. We forget about prayer. This happened to me many a time. But here was a man who kept praying for his nation. He said, Israel is a small nation. Jacob is a small nation. Please don't destroy it. Please don't destroy it. How many of you have prayed for the young people you want to communicate the gospel to? Do you know, you know Israel, Amos said in chapter 7 that Israel is a small nation. But we are talking about the world's biggest nation. The world's youngest nation. The world's second biggest nation in terms of population. At least 500 million young people. You know, I, uh, I get a lot of prayer requests. One of these is, Anna, I'm going to appear in the, uh, in, for an interview in the U.S. consulate for a visa. Please pray for me. We all want to take the first flight to the United States. And you know what is the population of the United States? About 300 million. We have young people in India greater than the population of the United States. We have a mission field here. Do we pray for the young people? Yesterday evening, I was, my mother, mummy is there, and I wanted to treat her. We went to KFC. And I was looking at, standing there to making my order. I saw young people walking in and making her orders. And I was, suddenly the Holy Spirit burdened me. KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. But look at these young people. They have everything in their life. But they're also going to eternal hell where they will be fried forever and forever without Jesus. I was whispering a silent prayer for them. But that's what Amos did. He did it systematically. He went to his prayer round and cried out to God. He was, you know, there's, a, there's another prophet who did the same. Jeremiah. You know, he was called the weeping prophet. Before he whipped people. Before he whipped people, sorry. Before he whipped people with his words of judgment, he wept for them in secret. Before he whipped people with the words of judgment, he wept for them in secret. So I want to ask you, young people, 
Do you have a personal prayer time? And second question, if you have a personal prayer time, are you only praying for, you know, you, your family, your brother and your sister? If you only do that, I'm encouraging you, I'm challenging you from God's word. Pray for the young generation, the Google generation. This is my prayer, you know, when I, when, 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 uh, when I went into the call center industry for two years, three years of my life, I would spend my time working in a call center with the HSBC group. I would pray, Lord, let the Google generation be grabbed from Gehenna. You know what the meaning of Gehenna? Gehenna is the Greek word for hell. Let the Yahoo youth be pulled towards Yahweh, the true God. That was my prayer. And Jeremiah, it, so Amos saw a picture of hell. In Amos chapter 4 verse 11, you know, he says, Jerusalem is like a, or Israel is like a half burnt stick. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is a full burnt stick. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? The country which was known for the sin of homosexuality, as Tirupati was known for Ladus. God's judgment came upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Sodom and Gomorrah is compared to a full burnt stick. Israel was like a half burnt stick. Before Israel also faces God's judgment, like Sodom and Gomorrah, Amos thought he must run to every Israelite and tell him about judgment that is coming in. And before he ran, he had to pray. He had to pray. When you watch your friend sitting next to you in your classroom, dialing next to you in your call center, eating next to you in your corporate office, a friend who does not know Jesus, his face must come before your eyes and you and I must pray. That's the first step. That's the first step. In fact, the name Amos means carry. In Hebrew, it means Amas, it means carry. You know what, what he carried? The burden of the Lord. In Amos chapter 2 verse 13, we read. Amos chapter 2 verse 13. And this is from the New English Bible translation. It says, Listen, I groan under the burden of you as a wagon creeps under a full load. I'm groan under the burden of you. God's burden is upon Amos. He's like a wagon. How many, how many of you have seen wa wagon? We've seen wagon R, the car. But what about wagon? The old fashioned wagon. Matuandi, as we say in our regional language. Can you imagine a wagon full of, full of pieces of rainy track piled upon one over the other like a mountain? The, the, the whole weight is upon the wagon and it's, it's, it's almost crumbling. That's the burden of souls that Amos felt. There's no other way, young people. I wish there was a shortcut. I wish I can give you a formula to communicate the gospel to young people. But there is no formula. There is no shortcut. You must go into your garden alone with God and sweat in prayer, sweat in intercession for the lost souls. That's how it begins. It's not about downloading some message online, but getting down on your knees and praying with a burden, the burden that Amos had. Secondly, second, write this down, second step. Second step to overcoming the barrier in communication that we have when you communicate the gospel with young people is search. Search. Now, there is evidence when we look at the messages of Amos that he searched the scriptures. For example, in chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, if you read, Amos chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, we read, Amos is trying, he's talking about King David. The most talked about character in the Old Testament. Why is he talking about David? He says, you know, he's talking about a sofa. And some people are sleeping on that sofa. They are rolling on that sofa. They are enjoying themselves on the sofa. Listening to some music like King David's music. Okay, the, they are listening to some music. They are rolling on that sofa. But you know what happens? The country is going to, to hell. His country, the country is going to ruin the country is going to destruction. The country is going to hell. And these people are rolling in their sofa. It's very true. Now you can go back from this camp. And you can go to your local church. You can go to your college. You can go to your, uh, your call center. You can, you, know, you can go there, come back, eat, sleep and 
pretend as if nothing has happened. But you know what? There is a world out there, young world out there, going to hell. And Amos says, these guys are rolling in the sofa listening to music like King David's. So he talks about King David, an Old Testament character. He talked about Exodus, the, the greatest event of the Old Testament. Amos chapter 2 verse 10. He says, remember Israel, though there was a time when we were slaves in Egypt, but God did a great favor by bringing us out of bondage in Egypt. God did us great favors, but now we are backslidden. We must repent. So what I'm saying is, Amos rooted his message on the Bible. Second, that's the second step. The second step in communicating the gospel with today's young people is to go to the Bible, search the scriptures. How many chapters do you think are there in the Bible? Approximately. Any guesses? There are 1,200 chapters approximately in the Bible. 1,189 to be precise. Let's keep it approximate. 1,200. Now, if you decide, if you decide to read 10 chapters of the Bible every day, you would have finished the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in four months. How many of you have had the, have had the privilege of reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, all the books? Yes, a few hands. Good. But those of you who didn't raise your hand, don't feel bad. Today you can start. Because if you don't search the scriptures, you can never preach a searching message which will touch the hearts of your generation. And that's one thing I did after I got saved. And after my seventh standard, I got saved. When I was in seventh standard in school, I got saved. The first change in my life was I fell in love with God's word. I started reading the Bible. I finished Genesis to Revelation and then I had a notebook. I divided the notebook into four or five parts. One part for temptation, because I wanted to speak to young people about temptations. Then another part about Bible meditation. Another part about witnessing, telling others about Jesus. Another part about second coming of Jesus. About six or seven, another part about relationships. Boy, girl relationship, relationship with parents, relationship with the same sex. No, I divided the, my notebook into five or six sections and then when I started reading the Bible, one from every section of the Bible, when I got a fresh thought, I put it down in paper. How many of you read the Bible with a pen in your hand? Yes, you must. How many of you have a marker pen to highlight the words that speak to you the most, highlight those phrases? Yes, you must. Because this is God's word. And when you read the Bible, God speaks to you. And without searching the scriptures, we can never effectively preach the gospel to our generation. So 1,200 chapters, never let that number go away. You, you plan, maybe you can't do 10 chapters a day. So you want to do the Bible in 8 months, you do read 5 chapters of the Bible every day, then you'd have finished Genesis to Revelation in 8 months. So you set your pace, but read the Bible. Read the Bible. We need to search. For example, you know, I used to, I've read some chapters. I, I call them as the youth special chapters of the Bible. One youth special chapter of the Bible, which I've searched and searched and searched till a message jumped out each time I searched is Genesis 39. What do you read in Genesis 39? What story do you read? Joseph. Yes. Joseph running away from Mrs. Potiphar. And one day when he was reading that for the nth time, this thought came to me. That madam is pulling him by the shirt. Madam is pulling Joseph by the shirt. And you know what Joseph would have said? I imagined when I read the Bible. This is imagination time. But this imagination comes because I'm searching that chapter, reading that chapter with the help of the Holy Spirit again and again. You know what thought came to me? This is what Joseph would have said when madam pulled his shirt. Madam? You want my shirt? You can take my shirt, no problem. I don't like shirts. My daddy gave me one shirt that day, multicolored shirt. The day I wore that shirt, I got into big trouble. My brothers got jealous of me. They put me in a pit and today I'm a slave in your house. Slave in Potiphar's house. It all began with that shirt. If you want my shirt, you take my shirt. But I can't have sex with you. Now how did this thought come to me? It came to me because I read, I 
and reread the whole chapter again. Not only the whole chapter, but the whole story of Genesis. The whole story of Joseph. So what am I saying, young people? Never leave a Bible passage till that Bible passage speaks to you. And once that passage speaks to you, you, you know, during your daily devotion, when you go to your college, when you go to your company, you can share what God taught you during your devotion to your friend who is sitting next to you. And what you share, I want to tell you, this has been my experience, will be prophetic for your friend. That friend will say, how do you know that how did you decide to actually share this Bible verse for me? This is so true for my situation. I heard that testimony so many times. But you can do that. Because there are many hungry hearts waiting for God's word from your mouth. So are you ready to search? Secondly, what's the first word? Supplicate. Second, search. Third, splash. Splash. S-E-L-A-S-H. This is from the artist's world. You know, I have a two-year-old daughter. And if I call her, Natasha, come here. And if I put before her some colors, watercolors, green, blue, purple, orange. And if I give her a paint, she doesn't need a paint. She'll put her hands on all these brilliant colors before her. And then she will splash and make a piece of modern art with her fingers. Splash. You know, that's what Amos does. He splashes word pictures. Now you can say, the Lord spoke, but you know what, how Amos puts it? Amos chapter 1 verse 2, the Lord roars. When I say roar, what do you think? What image comes to your mind? The lion. The Lord roars, that's what he writes in Amos chapter 1 verse 2. He's a splasher. A splasher, if you, if you can call it. I know it's not very good English, but he's a splasher of words. And I believe once when, you know, when he went to this prayer room, God told him, tell the people of Israel, that they cannot run away from judgment. What did God tell Amos? Tell the people of Israel that they cannot run away from judgment. You know how Amos put it? He said, he talked about a man who is running away from the lion. He's running away from the lion. He runs because a lion is chasing him. He turns back. A lion is chasing him. He's running and running and running and running. And then he thinks, oh, the lion is gone. I'm safe. Safe from the lion. Then he hears the growl of a bear. And he turns back, a bear is there and it's growling and it's tall and it's about to consume him and he runs from the bear now. He turns back, the bear is still there and he runs and runs, huffs and pants. He's running fast, fast as Usain Bolt, 9.58 seconds for 100 meters, 19.19 seconds for 200 meters. He's sprinting for his life and he turns back, no bear. The bear is not there. The lion is not there. It is Abba. I'm safe. Abhi Bajka. I'm safe. And then he's run and run. So he goes inside a house to take shelter from the hot sun. And he enters his house and he puts his hands on the wall. He can't even stand now. He's getting cramps. And then as he puts his hand on the wall, there's a crack on the wall. And from the crack on the wall comes a snake and bites him and he falls down <laughs> who narrated this story? Amos in chapter 5 verses 18, 19 and 20 that's what he, that's the story that Amos narrated the lion, bear, snake story of course I put some masala but Amos narrated it, you know why? to teach his people through word, word pictures that they cannot run away from judgment He's telling them, you can think you've run away from God. You can think you are safe. Just as you thought you were safe when you escaped the lion. Just as you thought you were safe when you escaped the bear. You may think you are safe. But he says, God will catch up with you. A day of judgment is coming when God will judge you for every sin. Every secret sin. That's the message that Amos wanted to communicate. But you know how he put it? Through word pictures. And where did Amos learn this from? He learned this from God himself. You look at Amos chapter 8, the first three verses, the Bible says, if you read, read Amos chapter 8, verse 1, 2 and 3, it says, God asked him a question. What's the question? You look at your Bible, you'll find the answer. God asked him, Amos, what do you see? What's Amos reply? A basket of summer fruit. 
And then God gives a message of judgment. And the message of that, 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 uh, that chapter is, the long summer of God's patience is over. But there has been no, there was no harvest of repentance. God is fed up with them. They, God is fed up with them. And he, to teach them a lesson about repentance, he shows them this summer fruit. You know, the, that is the last fruit of the agriculture season. God gave them time, but yet they did not give him the fruit of repentance. So he learned this from God. For example, in chapter 7, verses 7 to 9, God again asks him, What do you see, Amos? And he says, A plumb line. So God is showing him a fruit, a plumb line, the engineer's scale. And he's teaching him lessons. So that's how we must communicate with young people. Show them word pictures. I'm consciously, I'm, I'm consciously trying to do that. Now what do Indian young people see? Maybe they don't see a summer fruit. Maybe they don't see plumb line. But they see cricket matches. They see T20 matches. The other day I wrote a gospel poem around the, the last hour of a T20 match. Which hundreds of young people saw. Especially hundreds of Hyderabadis saw. That over in which Rohit Sharma took 21 runs of the last over. Hundreds of thousands of everybody saw that. I wrapped the gospel around the last hour. What do you see? Based on what do you see, what you see, you can wrap the gospel around that event. It could be a cricket match. So that's the third way. Splash. The fourth way. Sculpt. Now, Amos is like a sculptor. He is chiseling his message. You know, chiseled architect, a sculptor, if the nose is making a statue, if the no one side of the nose is fatter than the other side, he is chiseling away. That's what Amos did. He is chiseling in his messages. For example, chapter 9, verses 2 to 4, he talks, now look at the way he chisels his message. He uses the phrase, even if five times. Look at Amos chapter 9, 2 to 4, five times he uses, even if. When the helicopter wires are ready, went missing and India's biggest search operation took place, which many helicopters searching for a missing helicopter. I was thinking about this verse. Because God says here, even if you go and hide in Mount Carmel, I will catch you. Even if you go and hide under the sea, I will catch you. Even if you go there, I will catch you. Even if you go there, here I will catch you. My judgment will catch up with you. But there's a common factor there, even if, even if. And then if you read the first chapter, first chapter, verse 3, 6, 9, 11, 13, second chapter, verse 1, second chapter, verse 4, he, he uses this phrase, for three sins of Damascus, even four, the, place of, the name of the place changes, for three sins of this place, even four, for three cents of this place, even four. Now first, Amos is putting it in a very, very disciplined way, very sculptured way. The, he first talks about judgment for the enemies of Israel, not related to them. Who are the enemies of Israel? Damascus and Gaza. He says, God is going to judge you. And people of Israel are very happy. God's judgment is coming for our enemies. Second, he talks about the enemies of Israel who are also Abraham's descendants. That means enemies, uh, judgment for their own relatives. And then finally, he says, judgment for Israel. First, judgment for enemies of Israel. Second, judgment for relatives of Israel who are descendants of Abraham. Third, judgment for Israel itself. Progressive thought. A disciplined approach, a sculptured message. That's what we must do in our gospel presentations. Often I'm preaching this message. The first time I preached it when I was still in college, when I was still in Allahabad Agriculture Institute. When one day when I was reading God's word, God taught me how I can overcome temptations, how I can overcome sexual temptations. Then I, I got a, a series of S's. S yes, set. Set your mind like Daniel. Daniel resolved in his mind not to touch the king's foot. So beating temptations begins with the mind. You must know in your mind that 
Sin's temptations, sin's pleasures are only for a short season. Set. And then sprint. Joseph ran from Mrs. Potiphar. He ran. That's the second way to big temptation. Sprint. And then third, shoot. How did Jesus overcome temptation? He was shooting God's word. He was quoting God's word. So sprint, set, sprint, and shoot. And then it went on. What was I trying to do? I was trying to sculpture my message so that the message reached young people. A, there was a group of young people in America who they tried to advocate, teach young people that they should say no to sex before marriage. You know how they put it? I don't want your sex now. I will wait till we make the marriage wow. I don't want your sex now. I will wait till we make the marriage wow. So they are using symmetric lines, rhyming lines to drive home a message. So that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. No, I, I tell young people, you're in hell. Maybe God has put you in hell to plunder. God has put you in hell to plunder hell there. So sculpt. That's the fourth thing. So first, first thing, supplicate. Second, search. Third, splash. Fourth, sculpt. Fifth, shoot. Ask questions. Amos chapter 3 verses 3 to 6 and verse 8. We read nine of his thought-provoking questions. Nine questions that Amos asked. And one question is, can two walk together unless they are agreed? He's asking questions. Why is it important to ask questions when you make a gospel presentation? Do you want young people to earn for God's word when you speak on a one-on-one -on -one setting or, a, or, or even when you speak to a group? Ask questions. Amos is asking a question. One question is, can two people walk together unless they are agreed? One common question that comes to me is, no, I like this unbeliever girl. I'm a believer. I am feverish in my, in my enthusiasm for Jesus, but I love this unbeliever girl. Can I get married to her? Read Amos chapter 3 verse 3. It says, can two people walk together unless they are agreed? Eight years ago when I got married to my wife, after we got married, we walked down the aisle together. What were, what were we doing? We were taking practice to walk the road of life together. Solomon married women who worshipped other gods. And I tell young people, the one you take to bed will influence your head. Solomon was a brainiest man alive. A lot of brains. Jesus called him a brainy man, the wisest man. But all his brains were brainwashed by the idol worshipping women he married. So that's a lesson. I'm going off track, but you know, that's one question that Amos asked. Nine questions he asked in chapter 3. Can two people walk together unless they agree? So when you ask questions when you present the gospel with your friend, it involves their response. It invites their response. Paul was standing before Agrippa. And you know what he asked Agrippa in Acts chapter 26? You now if you read that beautiful story, it's a good example you know, to follow. What, how you can share the gospel when you're talking with your Believe. 15 minutes break, you're in the canteen, sitting with your friend, you have an opportunity to share the gospel. How do you do it? Like Paul, he shared his testimony with Agrippa. And then after his testimony, he asked the king Agrippa, he asked him, King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? A personal question. He calls Agrippa by name. How many of us try to name, learn the name of the person? We are trying to share the gospel with name. We will remember the name if we have knelt down in prayer for that person and ask the Lord, Lord, I want Sneha. Lord, I want Sharon. Lord, I want Sudhir. So you walk up to that person and say, Sudhir, Sneha, Sharon, do you believe in the prophets? That's what Paul asked. And then Agrippa was very stumped by that question. You know, he was shocked by that question. He said, in a, such a short time, do you, want me to make, do you want me to become a Christian? That question by Paul made him think. So ask questions. For example, you can ask a question. Why do you think a Yahoo engineer, a man who was with Yahoo, a top company, living in the United States with a beautiful wife, with a boy and a girl as a kid, why would he shoot five of his relatives and kill himself? It happened, you know. 
It is there. It was there on the in, 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 in that front page in Times of India. Why would that happen? You ask the question. What do you think happens when you if you suddenly die? Like why is that ready? Suddenly you go away. In a flash. In a, you die in a helicopter crash. What happens? After life. What happens when you, if you die suddenly? Now these simple questions. You know, they will open the gateway for you to share the gospel. Questions. Shoot questions. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? Why has already died? And the whole world is talking about sudden death. What do you think happens after you die? I think, I know what, I, what happens to me after I die. Because I believe in Jesus who died and rose again. The only person in the world who has done that. To die and rise again. And Jesus can, Jesus drives away every fear of death. You know, there are many ways in which you can share the gospel. Through a question, a well pointed question. You might be in the lift. It may be just three seconds or three minutes in the lift. During those three minutes in the lift with another member of the Google generation, when you ask a relevant question, you can still begin the gospel presentation. One of my favorite writers, Leonard Ravenhill, he asked a question. How do you take it easy with a thousand tribes to tell? How do you take it easy in a world that speaks to hell? One of my preaching heroes, I learned preaching from this great man of God, Art Stanley. When he preaches to churches, he would ask a question. Robert gave a question. Christianity, when did you pass life? Who rang your funeral bell? Questions. When you ask a question, it provokes the audience to think and he, it invites a personal response. So ask God to give you grace to ask evangelistic personal questions to your friend. That's the way. How do we preach the gospel so that the young people earn for God's word and not yawn? Sixthly, shock. Shock. Now young people, Amos, made some shocking statements. For example, in chapter 7, verse 11, we read, we understand, Amos 7, 11, he walked to the palace of the king. You know what was the king's name? Jeroboam. And you know what he told the king? Jeroboam, you will die by the sword. You know, usually what do people, when they see the king, what do they say? Those days, long live the king. So maybe that day when Amos walked into Jeroboam's court, he was, wait, was waiting for long live the king. But instead of long live the king, what did he get? Jeroboam, you will die by the sword because Israel has backslidden and God has sent me to announce his message to you. We must repent. If we don't repent, the Assyrian army will get us. Shock. And you know, people of Israel, one of the favorite verses is Exodus 19.6. You know what is Exodus 19.6? You are a royal priesthood. God chose Israel from all the countries of the world. They are a chosen generation. That is Exodus 19.6. To them, what did he say? You know what did he say? In Amos chapter 3 verse 2, very important verse. Amos 3 verse 2, he said, You alone have I chosen from all the earth. And everybody said, when he began saying that, You alone have I chosen from all the earth. Everybody said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then the next part of that sentence is, Therefore, I will punish you for your sins. So what? What did he say? Shut up. You know, there is a beautiful psalm in, in Psalm 128. It says, your wife will be like a fruitful wine in your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Psalm 128 verse 3. Wife will be like a fruitful wine. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your dining table. That is what people of Israel are familiar with. That's what they want to hear. But you know what he said? He was in chapter 7 verse 17. He said, your wife will be like a prostitute. Wow! Your sons and daughters will be killed because we didn't repent. Because we are going away from God. God is going to send the Assyrian army. They will take your wives as prostitutes. Your sons and daughters will be killed. This was a shocker. Young people, do you want to effectively communicate the gospel? Do you want to communicate the gospel so that young people will earn for God's word and not yawn? You must be ready to shock. Tell people what they must hear and not what they want to hear. The 
Many people want to hear something. God is going to always bless you. You're going to have a Benz car. You know, the, the ticket for your place in heaven is already booked. So you can live in sin. These are the things that young people want to hear. But we must be ready to shock them. Not for the sake of shocking, but because the God's, God's word says so. Oftentimes I'm talking to young people. They ask the question, you know, this is a question that is all in their heart. They don't know how to ask it, but sometimes they ask it. No, can I, how, how far is too far? I'm a boy, I have a girlfriend, can I touch my girlfriend intimately? Then, I preach to them from God's word. And it's shocking for some old people. And it's shocking for some young people. And sometimes, you know, it is shocking for everybody who listens. But this is what I say. If you read Ezekiel 23, Ezekiel 23 talks about two girls who allowed men to play with their breasts. And God calls that act as prostitution. When I say that, shocking. But it's truth. The story of two girls in Ezekiel 23 is a shocker. You know, we live in a world where premarital sex is cool. You know, recently, you know, we have movie stars. They live in together, they have children, and after they have children, they get married. Their daughter becomes the, the flower girl for the wedding. The daughter becomes the flower girl for their own wedding because they are living it together many, many years before marriage. For such a generation, if you tell them that God, this is what God thinks of premarital sex, read 1 Samuel chapter 2. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, Eli's sons were sleeping with the women in the temple and God was planning to kill them. Why was God planning to kill them? They had premarital sex. It is a shocker, but we must proclaim it. You tell your friend who thinks all religions are one of the same, that Jesus is the only way, it will be shocking for him. Tell him, what Acts chapter 4 verse 12 to him, salvation is found in no one else, but only in the name of Jesus. Quote John 14, 6 to him, it will be a shocker, but you must do it. I did that, I remember when I was working in, a, in, a, in one company, during break, my manager, I was reporting to that, that, that guy, he said, Duke, I know you're religious, I know you write articles, but I believe in all religions. I said, yes, I have heard you, but I, if you believe, if you say that you equally believe in all religions, all religions will lead to the same destination, you are calling Jesus a liar. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can either take him for his word and believe what he said was the truth, but if you say all religions are one of the same, you are calling Jesus a liar. It was a shock for him, but I said it. Years ago, in a company, you know, one man walked up to a random young man and said, Raj, you're a good man. You're a sincere in your work. But you know what? Jesus is the only way. And then he said, here is the Bible. Read this book and you'll know more about Jesus. And Raj took that Bible from that colleague of his who witnessed by saying, Jesus is the only way. It was a shocker for Raj. He said, I will read your Bible and prove from the Bible that Jesus is not the only way. And he began reading the Bible. And Raj fell in love with the Bible. He became a believer. Today he has traveled over 20 countries preaching the gospel. How did it begin? When young one colleague of his in his company was ready to shock, said, Jesus is the only way. And the same Raj, I'm talking about evangelist Raj Kumar of Delhi, some of you have heard him, whom God has used to preach in many countries of the world, many universities of the world. He even preached in a Sai Baba temple in, in South Africa, the gospel of Jesus Christ. How did it begin? When one of his colleagues went to him and said, Jesus is the only way. He didn't even give him any proof. No, there are proofs for that. The proof is, no one has this explosive combination. Now, Australia had Glenn McGrath and Shane Warren. Explosive pace and spin combination. Jesus has this combination. Sinless life coupled with miracles. No one in history had this explosive combination of sinless life coupled with miracle working ability. Are you ready to shock? Ready to shock? Then, secondly, show. Secondly, spot. Okay, spot. Now, Amos, you know what he did? He spotted the issues that were burning at this time. You know what was the most burning issue during Amos' time? Rich people were getting richer, poor people were getting poorer. Amos saw that and he talked about it. 
For example, in chapter 6, verses 21 onwards, he says, in a modern translation, he says, Do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. Now, we want fairness and we go for fair and lovely cream. But Amos is not talking about fair and lovely cream, cream fairness. He's talking about fairness. You know, poor people are getting poorer. Rich people are getting richer. He said, God, this is not the way of God. God wants justice. Rivers of justice. God wants fairness. Rivers of fairness. He's talking about it in Amos chapter 6. And in Amos chapter 4 verse 1, he's talking about cows of Bashan. Cows of Bashan. Now, there are some places known for some things. For example, Hyderabadi Biryani, Tripadi Laddu. And then you go to South Rajapa, uh, uh, there is a dog breed. A, dog, a, a famous dog lives a, a, is, is from the town of Rajapalaya. But you know, he, he's talking about cows of Bashan. The cows of Bashan were very healthy looking. Amos chapter 4 verse 1. He compared that to prosperous, rich women. They were many big men. Big, big men, they're like big fat cows. And you know what? He talks about them. He says, you have influenced your husbands to oppress the poor. You cows of Bashan. You rich ladies from the country of Bashan. You have influenced your husbands to oppress the poor. So what is he doing, Amos? He's spotting the issues of his time and talking about it. Do we do that? When we communicate to young people, we must talk about the issues, spot the issues they are struggling with and talk about it. They talk and talk about it. Now, uh, that's something which I, I try to do. The other day I was reading the newspaper. Not maybe a, a one week back before the champions trophy began, Champions Trophy began, there was an interview in Deccan Chronicle, a huge headline. It said, Coach Kirsten advocates sex for supremacy in sport. And then a lot of quotations. He said, quote, Gary Kirsten, India's national cricket coach said, okay guys, you must have a lot of sex if you want to succeed in sport, succeed in cricket. And he knows, okay, Tendulkar is married and a few other guys are married, but Yuvraj is not married. Dori is not married. And he says, if you're not married, you learn to go solo. And he says, it's very convenient. But I read that. And two days later, I speak in a teens camp. And I know these teens are struggling with this issue of solo sex or masturbation. And then I made reference to that article. And I took them to 1 Corinthians 7, where it says, it is better to marry than burn with passion. It doesn't say better to masturbate than burn with passion. I know it's not very easy to talk about it from stage, but if young people are struggling, especially the teenagers are struggling, I as a youth evangelist must talk about it. Must talk about it. So that is why young people, you want to communicate the gospel in a relevant way to your generation, be, don't be like a frog in the well. Be aware of what is happening around you. How many of you know at least the names of the news magazines? Reputed news magazines that are talking about what is happening in our country. India Today, Outlook, The Week magazine, and then we have two new magazines, The Sunday Indian, and now the latest one is called The Open. The Open magazine, okay, it's a news magazine. It talked about, it had a picture of a girl and a boy very recently and said, 13 and dating. So it's saying in India, in some cities, boys and girls go for dating when they are when? At, when they are 13 years old. Now, if we talk to young people without spotting the issues, chances are they will never listen to us. If you think that these issues don't exist, they, they will think you don't exist when you speak to them. You get me? If you think these, ex these issues don't exist with young people and you speak as if these issues don't exist, and much of the preaching in our churches, I'm not critical, but I'm being analytical. Much of the preaching that we have, regular Sunday morning preaching we have in churches, assumes that young people are not struggling with many of the problems. And we have regular mundane messages. Without talking about the issues. Now, I don't want you to be critical of your, your Sunday morning preacher. You make a difference. You may never have a pulpit to preach on. But you know what? I never had a pulpit to preach on when I started out. I remember the times when we used to gather outside chemistry department in my engineering college. When I took my friends, sometimes one friend came, sometimes two, sometimes three. With the friends who gathered around, 
I taught them what the Bible teaches about burning issues. What I understood. Then God blessed that and opened pulpits and mics and video cameras for me. It, I didn't start like that. So over coffee during your coffee break, under tree during your lunch break in school, you know your friend is struggling. Your friend is struggling with loneliness. He thinks nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. You have a friend who doesn't like the shape of her nose. And she is struggling with it. She's even thinking, I will commit suicide because I don't like the shape of my nose. I don't like it that I'm only 5 feet and 2 inches. I wish I was 5 feet 6 inches. Low self-esteem. Can you go and quote Psalm 139 for them? That God has made you beautifully and wonderfully. One verse from Psalm 139 will cure their heartache. They want to hear it from you. Do you spot the issues they are struggling with? And do you talk about it? Spot. And then, eightly, smile. How do you preach to God? Young people, in a way that they will earn for God's word, and not yawn. Smile. Use humor. You know what Amos said? In Amos chapter 4 verse 4, Go to Bethel and sin. Can you believe the Bible says in Amos, Go to Bethel and sin. You think you should take Amos seriously? He's actually being sarcastic. He's smiling wryly as he's saying, Go to Bethel and sin. He's using humor. It's like, no, Prophet Elijah in Mount Carmel. Elijah in Mount Carmel, do you know what happened in, Elijah? in there? The Baal prophets are cutting themselves and crying out to their God in Mount Carmel. Elijah does not want them to cry out like that, but you know what he said? Cry out louder. He doesn't want them to cry out louder. He wants them to repent and believe in the true God, Yahweh. But you know what Elijah said? You cry out louder. Cry out louder. Maybe your God is in the toilet. Maybe he has gone for a vacation. So you cry out louder. So he's using sarcasm. Or he's actually cracking a, a joke to drive a message. And I try to do that. You know, when I have to speak to young people on youth issues. There's a time when I talk about what the Bible teaches about sex. And then the, the first point is, you know, uh, God created sex for procreation. And I talk about Jacob. Jacob in the Bible had 12 sons. That is a good enough for one cricket team. And there's a place for 12th man also. The young people find it funny. So, you know, we cannot entirely preach serious messages. You know, the corporates have understood that. How many of you have seen the mentors ad? There's a guy who tries to enter the classroom late. See that? Yes. And the professor says, get out. And then he turns and writes. And the same guy, down this time, he changes the direction. He pretends as if he's going out of the class. And the professor comes back, absent-minded professor, looks at the same guy and says, sit down. And we had a laugh about it. But you know, that stays in our mind. Good humor stays in our mind. The corporates use humor to make millions of dollars. But can you use humor to win, to bring someone close to Jesus? You can. You can. Ninthly, and I just will finish in the next five minutes. Ninthly, show. Show young people how the Bible applies to a practical life. Now, Amos has read the law of Sabbath. You must keep the Sabbath holy. But you know how he showed his people how they can actually, how they are actually not keeping the law of Sabbath. In Amos chapter 8 verse 4 he said, When will the Sabbath get over so that we may market wheat again. Amos chapter 8 verse 4. What is he saying? He says, you know the law of Sabbath but you're not keeping it from your heart. You want the Sabbath to get over quickly so that you can go back to your corrupt practices. So that's what we must do. Read God's word with prayer and show how practically it applies to the lives of young people. There was this king. He was he, he had just committed adultery and there was this prophet. His prophet was standing before him and he was narrating the mutton biryani story. He said, a mutton biryani had to be prepared. 
and this rich man had several sheep in his house. Instead of cutting one of that sheep to prepare mutton biryani, he went to his neighbor's house, a poor man. He had only one sheep. And he plucked that sheep from the neighbor's house and he prepared mutton biryani out of the neighbor's house. Out of that one sheep in the neighbor's house, that poor man's house, King David got very angry. And then, so far, Nathan was putting his hands in his pocket. And then he took his hands off. And he said, you are that man. David, you are that man. Now so far he tried to tell him a story. And he hoped that they would get the message. But he didn't get the message. So David, so Nathan applied the mutton biryani story to, Nathan applied the mutton biryani story to David. And he said, you are that man. So, we must speak practical messages to young people. That's the lesson here. Practical. And that's what I try to do. How imperfectly. How to pray. How to overcome temptation. How to be a witness for Jesus. How? We must tell people how. How the Bible applies to our life. How can we win over temptation? How? Show them how. And then finally, stop. Stop. Amos preached short messages. Speak me and live. Amos 5.4. How many words? Amos 5.4. Seek me and live. Four words. Short messages. I remember when I had 15 minute break when I was working in HSBC. We'd go to an area of the company where nobody would come and I would read one Bible verse and preach one sentence message. The message was only one sentence long. And then I would pray. The fellowship lasted only three minutes. But through that, people were blessed. Through that, the Google generation was being grabbed from Gehenna, from going to hell. Short messages. Now, somebody said, you know, if you want to get a kiss from your audience, you must follow the kiss principle. K-I-S-S. -S. If you want to get a kiss from your audience, you must follow the kiss principle. K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it short and sweet. K-I-S-S. -S. -S. Keep it short and sweet. You know, you, there, there will come a time, it may, be, it may happen when you are talking one on one with a person or you are talking to a crowd like this. You know, it, there will come a time when the audience wants you to go on. They are earning for you to go on. They are longing for you to go on. You know, they are eager for you to go on. At that point, as the Holy Spirit tells you, stop. But if you keep going, if you keep dragging it, there will come a point when the audience wants you to stop and you are going on and on. There's a small difference, but the results will be great. You know, I've been in youth meetings, and then the Holy Spirit will abruptly tell me, you know, I would have just preached for 30 minutes or 32 minutes, and the Holy Spirit will tell me, stop, and give an altar call. And when I obeyed, I've seen 80% of the audience, 90% of the audience give their life to Jesus. But there are times when I have disobeyed, when I kept preaching, because I have more illustrations. I have a story about Michael Schumacher. I have a story about Boris Becker. I have a story about Virendra Seva. I want to finish up all the illustrations, whatever I've prepared. And then give an altar call. After a long message, I've seen the result has not been that great. So stop. No way to stop. When you're talking one-on-one -on -one with a person, or when you're talking in a group, over close to 18,000 colleges in India, over three, about 350 universities, 105 lakh students, and then thousands of call center employees. They are waiting to hear it from you. They may never actually go to a, a gospel meeting where Brother Benny Hinn is the preacher, a gospel meeting where Dr. Paul Dinakran is the preacher. They may never go to a regular gospel meeting like that, but they will hear you when you are standing in that lift and talking about Jesus. They will hear you when you are talking about Jesus during your coffee break. They will hear you during the Christmas program that you'll organize. You say, we are going to have a Christmas batch. Come over. They will come for that. And you will have only 10 minutes to talk about Jesus. Would you talk about Jesus the way Amos talked about Yahweh? Would you think of these 10 points and present the gospel? That's the challenge. That's what I invite you to do. That's what I invite you to do. Somebody said, if you try and fail, you may be disappointed. But if you don't try at all, you'll be doomed. Even as you're listen, listening to me, you're thinking, Duke, will it work? Now the question is not whether it, will it work. The question is, will you be ready to do it? 
Some of you think that friend of mine in my college, in my call center, in my corporate office will never become a believer. So why should I share the gospel with them? You must. If you read Ezekiel 33, you must. God says, you go and warn that wicked man. If he listens, you have saved yourself from your, uh, you have saved yourself and he has saved himself. If he doesn't listen, he will be lost, but you have saved yourself. And I will not require his blood from you. I will not require his blood from you. God will require on the judgment day the blood of your friends, the fr friends you rub shoulders with, your colleagues, the people in your neighborhood. You are responsible. Are you ready to communicate the gospel with them? Just close your eyes. Now I'm going to give some time for questions. We have about 15 minutes more. But let's close our eyes and make a, commit, make a commitment to God before we go to a time of question and answers. How many of you will say, I will do what it takes to be a communicator of the gospel. I will pray with an open mind. Would you make a commitment to, to watch what is happening in the world around us, around you? And wrap Bible truth around those events, around that helicopter crash, around that cricket match, around what that movie starlet said, around that suicide of that big business baron. Would you decide? Would you make an attempt? How many of you will say, I'll make an attempt to share the gospel using these principles? I'm not even going to open my eyes. I want you to just lift up your hand and drop it down. Even as they go to their world, their corporate world, the college world, their, their, their community world, and even as they practice these things that we have learned from Prophet Amos, and share your word, your gospel with their generation, I pray that you will bless their efforts. And through their ministry, many hundreds and thousands and lakhs of young people will come to Jesus. That the world's youngest nation, which is India, will be saved in and through their work, O Master. We thank you for this challenge. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. There's no clear uh, answer for this. Uh, like uh, all youngsters in our church, uh, wherever we go, uh, we have a lot of burden to do, uh, launch a website or do a lot many activities for you, but uh, we don't know how to take it to the, the pastors where they have different set of mind, they have very traditional way to uh, give gospel and so many other things. And uh, when we do this, uh, they feel like this is like uh, they're trying to bring new breed into the church or this is not the way we have been already. So there's a lot many uh, hurdles in their own mindset, but how? Because uh, the blood of Lord Jesus is flowing in, in us also. I mean, it's not about the age, but it's about being born again or not. And when we are born again, we have the burning passion to win souls as well. But how to communicate to those people, there's a lot of generation gap. At the same time, how to enlighten them on these things without uh, being uh, radical enough. Uh, in a helpless situation, that's what, seemingly helpless situation, especially you pray. Pray for your pastor. Pray for a breakthrough. And then, don't, you know, the, the thing is, you must, you must try to work your way. Where there is a will, there is a way. So in your own circle, if you, if you don't get your church platform, fine. I'm not asking you to rebel against church. And slowly, surely, down the line, if not in your time, there will be some change. So that's my answer. It might sound simplistic, but that's the best we can do. Or if it is a youth camp like this, or if it is we are talking to a particular like youth, uh, youth people, but I never see we speak or the preachers speak or even those uh, leaders whoever comes speaks so openly uh, to our uh, youth in church. Is it that we don't require it they think or we are so good as if in the church. I agree. And uh, I want to tell you that I have done that you know I have lost a lot of friends and even more personal I have lost even preaching opportunities for being very blunt. But I don't care, you know, I don't care because I need to, at the end of the day, at the end of my life, I need to obey what God tells me to do, not what humans tell me to do.
but you need to pray for preachers. And then, now, the reason why we are in a discipleship camp like this is, you also are going to communicate the gospel, present the gospel in your own way. So you make, start making the difference. One person can make a difference. You make the difference. I mean, instead of always thinking about the other person, and instead of thinking the other person will be the solution for the problem that I'm facing, you can think, what can I do to be the solution? Ask what you can do for your country, said John F. Kennedy. Ask what you can do for that situation in your youth group or in your church. You can make a difference. Many young people nowadays, uh, they're atheists. They don't believe in God, like uh, in the place where I work. Last scam, and the preacher was asking how many of you don't believe in God. Many of them, they raise their hands. Okay. And in such a situation, you know, if we bring out biblical issues and biblical morals, they uh, they wouldn't just agree, and they will not even jail to us, and things uh, will not work it out. So, what do we do to communicate the gospel in such a situation? Now, when a person says he doesn't believe in God. Now, when you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, you must ask him why he doesn't believe in God. Because we have valid reasons to believe in God. Now, if you read books on apologetics, and there was a there's one track, one workshop on apologetics as to now, how to answer such a question. And now, how do, why do we believe in God? Why is Jesus the only way? Now, some of my books talk about that. Okay, and some of my CDs talk about that. So, we find answers for the questions they're asking and wrap those answers you know, in a normal way around contemporary events and bring it. And again, remember, you are not responsible to convert them. You are only called to share the good news with them. And the Holy Spirit will act in their heart. And, uh, you know, it might take time. But your job is to sow. God's job is to make the seed that you have sown grow. So don't think of what the result is going to be and you think that it's going to be negative, so don't make the mistake of not starting. Don't make the mistake of not starting. You start, the Lord will bless you.